factors just and yeah so maybe this is um uh, will be a perfect opportunity for everyone who's applying at this season or eventually applying next year um so um what about you guys what have you been up to louder hi everyone um uh, i'm laura i'm a third year medical student from brazil and i want to say that saturday it was amazing everybody loved it um and I think it is already on YouTube, so if you if you get a chance, you can watch it um, later. And today I'm going to present um, a poem case, so I'm really excited. And yeah, just happy to be here with you all. Okay, and I just saw that um, our expert discussant, um, Candice, was able to uh, join. So if you are able, would you be willing to unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself and um, your background information? Was, was that directed towards me? It, it was. Ah, yeah. fantastic. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I uh, left my charger in the Bronx suite today. So uh, I was trying to call with my phone. Um, so you guys are getting me with my laptop with hopefully enough charge left on until uh, this uh, um, laptop bursts into combustible flames. But I'm an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins uh, School of Medicine in pulmonary and critical care medicine and excited to be here with you all tonight. Awesome. Well, um, Laura is going to present a pulmonology case. And if it's okay, I figured um, we could just let you go through and um, discuss it um, on your own. Is that okay with you? Um, or would you like to be paired with um, an audience volunteer discussant? It, it does not bother me one way or the other. However, I'm, I'm here to flow with you all. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, Laura, um, do you want to get started on the case? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so the chief complaint is um, cough, but I'm not sure. Do you want me to like to say the HPI already or just reflect on um, cough? If you're asking me, I, I, Laura, I want you to dive into this as you would to anyone else. I am, I'm, I'm going to listen to you, my friend, however you feel like you should share this patient story. Okay, so I'm going to reach the HPI because, um, yeah, because I think it's a good idea. So it's a 53-year-old male, previously healthy, um, presenting with coughing that lasts four months. The cough happens 24 hours a day at short intervals with flare-ups, which lead to a drop in oxygen saturation to 75 um, and the cough is not productive and there were no other symptoms associated. Um, he denies fevers or joint pains, rashes, weight loss, and it's progressively worsening with um, tiredness. When the cough began, he was on a trip to a country town uh, visiting his mother-in-law. He was uh, previously, previously treated with azithromycin, az azithromycin and daveron. Um, showing no results. And the, um, he said that the previous doctor suspected asthma, asthma and GERD. So he was um, treated uh, without improvement of the symptoms. And he has been taking prednisone for one month, um, showing no response. So, so I uh, think I'm gonna stop here. Yeah, no, Laura, let me, let me just jump in and then, you know, we'll, we'll uh, go to everyone else, but I want to make one point really clear. So I know I'm a lung doctor and you guys are staring at this guy with that smile. Probably someone asked me to smile on the camera and by giving me a pulmonary reference. That's how you get that big smile out of me. I love the lungs. And one thing I try to make it clear, like what cough is to a lung is like pain to a, a foot that's just stepped on a nail, right? The lungs are coughing usually for a reason. Like they're trying to get your attention. Right, they don't. That cough doesn't want to be suppressed. It's letting you know like something's going on, and so you know I, I love that you know sounds like someone else was sleuthing through, knocking out common reasons for coughs that we get taught, you know, from GERD to postnasal drift to maybe asthma. But you know when we, they come and see us in pulmonary, someone's already put that investigation in there. 
And so from my standpoint, what I really try to investigate is like, what are the lungs trying to clear, right? Because that's it. Lungs have no pain receptors, right? With their whole defense mechanism against unwanted things is going to be a cough. So something is going on. And that's how I view it and that's how I pursue it. There could be other reasons as well. Someone put in medication side effects. That's fair, that's fair. You know, I think of that as well. But from my standpoint, what I'm trying to slew through is why does the lungs want to cough? What's going on? What underlying potentially pulmonary to systemic thing is, is uh, happening? If you're telling me he's 54 years of age, otherwise healthy, one question I'm going to ask you, then we can turn it over to the flow of the audience. So one thing I want people just to recognize is coughs are reactive. They're important, right? If you guys, if a patient came to you with a knife through their foot, you wouldn't just give them pain medication and say, there you go. You treat the underlying what's going on. So one thing I'm hoping you all recognize is if someone comes to you with a cough, don't, you know, cough suppressant shouldn't even be on your radar, right? Because the lungs don't want that, right? The, it'll wear off and the cough will come back. So definitely slew through. But one thing I want to ask is in those last months, did he ever have an infection? Like, did he have a bad cold that, you know, he can pinpoint is like, hey, I was sick for a little bit and it went away, but here I am now. No, he, he denies any any other symptoms. It was um, just the cough. So the cough came on a little, it sounds like insidi in an insidious fashion, just began kind of casually and then really picked up steam. All right, well done. Plot thickens there. Okay, so do you want me to go on? I do, yes. If, if it's appropriate for others to weigh in, happy to, but you are welcome to. Yeah, I mean, I we can definitely see, um, I see um, Vivek um, kind of put some things that he was um, thinking of. Um, would you be in a place where you could like unmute and just kind of share a few thoughts? So, you know, just the cough and the time interval for which he's had it, you know, the period of four months, uh, he hasn't had any sort of, uh, you know, fevers or weight loss associated with that. So, um, my initial considerations uh, for the cough were, one, if there's been, uh, you know, third is, is always when, uh, you know, congestive heart failure could be another uh He doesn't have any associated orthopnea or, you know, uh, dyspnea and insertion. Um, chronic asthma could be something, medication, especially if he's on um, Or I was thinking if he has any sort of occupational exposure uh, to, you know, uh, asbestos or you know, cotton or something to the farmer or silicone products. Um, those are those are all uh, kind of on my differential list right now. And uh, I am on the Chicago train, not the New York train, uh, but it's still noise. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I saw a few other thoughts in the chat um, about like TB, um, just a good medication history and everything like that. Um, Panagis, is there anything like if someone came in to your clinic visit or you were seeing as a consultant in the hospital, um, kind of with this chief complaint and history about like kind of follow-up questions that you would ask or kind of be thinking of? Yeah, so I mean, from my standpoint, a, a good just cough assessment, you know, from that standpoint, it sounds like it is dry. Times of the day that makes it think if you think of cough like pain, what makes it better, what makes it worse? There is a rhyme or reason, just most people just haven't really thought much about it, right? So that's where you're trying to get their attention in a sense of tell me a little bit about that. Because, you know, is something externally triggering it or internally triggering it, that's what you're going to try to slew through. In addition to that, you do want to make sure infectious etiologies have been really well captured. So I, I say this because like occupational exposures and so forth, like they come on, but in a in like the world's slowest time course, like decades of a cough buildup that you put them down there, like, yeah, you know what, maybe 15 years ago that cough began. So I'm thinking of um, you know, someone's comment around asbestosis. This one picked up full head of steam over the last four to six months, coming on sounds like gradually and not to this. So there's not that many diseases that would 
come on, you know, eh, it's there, not a big deal. And then ramp up where I'm seeking out medical attention. So infection comes to mind to some extent, but it's not a lot of ones. Pertussis is very common in this setting, like an adult one set of pertussis can do this. The challenge is it's a violent cough in the beginning and it's a violent cough at the end. From an infectious standpoint, TB doesn't strike me that much because again, unless you had a reason to become immunosuppressed, you don't like the way TB will come on is a lot, you know, immunocompetent person, that cough is like years in the making. So what's, while infections high on my wrist, there's not a lot of infections that will cause that gradualness and then heighten, um, heighten unless something catastrophic has happened. Granted, the patient was, sounds like they were given antibiotics, so that could have changed a little bit of the microbiome and potentially causing the patient to get a worse cough. We see that a lot with uh, mycobacterial infections. You throw at them a little bit of azithromycin, they become a little bit more resistant, a little bit more potent, cough worsens. So infections on the radar, not as high of a list on my end. I think where I'd start doing now is just looking at more systemic things that could potentially become gradual in the patient that will result in more chronic cough. That's how I'm thinking about this. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Laura, would you share some more information? Yeah, sure. So for um, the medications, he, he was um, taking nothing before the prednisone and uh, family history. Um, his mother has diabetes, asthma, and a lung cyst. And social history, uh, he works as a company administrator and usually takes trips to his mother-in-law's city. And her house is known to contain mold, uh, but has, he has never had an allergy to it. And as for health-related behaviors, um, he denies uh, alcohol, tobacco, and illicit drugs use and um, denies allergies. So I'm going to jump to the physical exam because, yeah. So the Laura, would you share it? Laura, would you share the current dose of like prednisone and kind of what it's been? Uh, it's uh, 60, 60 milligrams a day. And the time it's uh, for a month. I'm sorry. So Laura, they, someone started him on prednisone at yeah. 60 milligrams? I'm not sure if he started with 60, but he was currently um, taking 60. Understood, understood. I guess what I'm coming at is someone threw at him a very high dose of prednisone. And what he relayed to you was no improvement. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Fascinating, fascinating. Okay, plot think uh, it's Laura. Keep it going, my friend. Okay, so the temperature is 35.6, oh, point, point 0.5, I'm sorry, 36.5, yes, sorry. Uh, and the heart rate, 92, uh, blood pressure, 120 over 80, respiratory rate, 28, um, oxygen saturation, 90%. He had um, good, good general condition, and the only... Uh, the only thing that he um, actually had was um, in the pulmonary exam, he had rails at the bases of both lungs and everything else was just normal. Rails at the bases, Laura, you don't just drop that to a pulmonologist and just casually say normal afterwards. You got my attention, my friend. I mean, you got my attention when you said cough. Um, I do wanna just make a point you know, because we get so many people coming into our clinic saying, I got mold, I have mold. We all breathe in mold. Every single, like, I'm looking at Kiara, I'm looking at Vivek, you guys are breathing in mold as we speak. You like to think you're not, you are. And sometimes a lot of mold is very obvious and moldy, but we are breathing these spores in and out constantly. So the majority of us, even if I put you literally in a mold party and you just breathe in all these spores, if you have no, yeah, thank you for that, yeah. Um, if you have no underlying pulmonary conditions, your lungs will just breathe them back out, right? For mold, for aspergillosis especially, to become an allergic reaction, right? Because aspergillosis is fascinating. It, it, it doesn't cause infections unless really your, your immune system is rather rocked for some extent, but it's usually thought of as more of an allergic reaction. Like we think of things like ABPA, but you need an underlying condition for it. You need like what mold, what paint is to a canvas, 
aspergillus is to some underlying lung disease. You need a predisposition to have that. So even though he brings up mold, sounds upsetting. I just can't see suddenly in his mid fifties developing a mold allergy, unless you're telling me he has had some issues. Now, with that said, if he's on 60 milligrams of prednisone and now go into that mold infested place, now the plot <laughs> is very different, right? We, we see that happen a lot, for instance, in our sarcoid patients. They develop fungal balls, um, aspergillomas, you know, in high dose immunosuppressants and so forth. So anyway, back to you. I have a quick question. How do you normally see if someone's on like high dose steroids and develops an um, aspergilloma? How do you see that normally present? Coughing. Coughing is usually the predominant symptom. Occasionally that cough will be wet, but it's a dry cough. And then it progresses to massive uh, dyspnea. And depending where that uh, fungal ball is growing, you can have some pleuritic chest pain associated with it. But it is it's a very insidious diagnosis, one that got the patient to the hospital for usually other reasons. You scan the chest and there it is. Because remember, you, you need the immune system competent to cause a lot of symptoms. So the fact that he doesn't have fevers, I wouldn't expect someone to not have, you know, he's on 60 milligrams of prednisone. That's a great antipyretic right off the bat. So, you know, a lot of the immunocompetent things you're looking for in these uh, infections or allergies are going to be robbed or deprived or greatly attenuated because of the steroids. So just, you know, that's what I'm thinking. Something, someone threw things at him, nothing happened. So then he tried prednisone. And the, the telltale sign, if this is going to be a reactive inflammatory condition, prednisone should have worked. I mean, prednisone is, you know, as lung doctors, I love our field, but we got steroids and we got in, antimicrobials. That's all we got. And um, if prednisone didn't cut it, especially after the first couple of days, uh, you know, that's a telltale sign you were missing something. Or it's just not, you know, missing something, meaning this, it's not, it's not a prednisone, potentially it's not a prednisone, um, uh, it's a prednisone impacting disease. Amazing. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue. Is it okay, or do you want to say something? Can, can I ask um, just one more follow-up question? Um, so one of the other things I sometimes think about if someone's on high dose prednisone and like pulmonary conditions get worse is something like strontuloides, especially in an <laughs> endemic country. Um, do you have like experience about like the lung manifestations and how that would present? So ask that one more time. Are you asking my experience with um, international mm -hmm. patients and presenting with a cough in that setting? Yeah, so just about like kind of strongyloides and like how that might present. Um, I was just kind of curious about kind of thinking about comparing illness scripts and everything. Yeah, no, I, unfortunately I have, uh, the only strongyloides patients I've had have been really more in like the transplant or uh, onc center. So I haven't had them kind of walk into my clinic. So. I don't have that clinical experience uh, to kind of weigh in from that standpoint. So it's, it's hard for me to kind of make an advocacy from that. I feel like if it's strong eloides or other parasitic diseases, I feel like presumably someone has drawn blood on this human being at some point in time. And if I saw things like eosinophilia then, and a, tra a good travel history, but yeah, no, uh, not, I don't have the clinical experience in, uh, from that standpoint. I have it definitely immuno immunely uh, deprived uh, individuals and seeing what it's done to them, but not, not in this case, I have not, not too much experience. Awesome. Um, Laura, would you share some um, more of the labs? Yeah, sure. So, okay, so for the labs. Uh, oh, Laura, why... before you share the labs, quick question. Are these labs yeah. while 160 milligrams of steroids or different? Hmm. I don't know. I think, no, it, uh, he was taking steroids. Because ah, the labs okay. are from um, June and, and like it's when he arrived, so he, he was taking. Okay. Uh, it, and this was before COVID. I forgot to say that before, but it was um, before. Okay. So uh, white blood uh, cells is 12,100 
being 64% neutrophils and 26% lymphocytes, and hemoglobin 14.7 and HT 43% and platelets 295,000. And ESR2, um, creatinine 0 0.91, um, total bilirubin 0 0.5, um, TSH 2.06, um, CRP 20.49, rheumatoid factor 3.5, um, antinuclear antibodies negative. Actually, every um, autoantibody that uh, were negative, Cianca, Bianca, um, uh, anti-DNA autoantibody also negative, um, everything negative, yeah. hepatitis B and C and VDRL and HIV negative, VAR negative, um, C3 uh, 165 and C4 3034 30, and anti-synthetase antibodies all negative and protein electrophoresis normal. That's the end. Did you get everything? Okay Laura, what did you say was his albumin? Uh, I didn't say because I don't have it here. Wait, I'm, I'm going to check just a minute. No worries. So albumin is one of my favorite markers of disease. Um, and just to put, put this to rest in case anyone's thinking about it, it is not a great, it is a horrible marker for nutrition. Um, there's a great study out of the 90s by our psychiatry friends who evaluated um, teenagers, BMIs no greater than 15, uh, anorexia specifically, and their albumins were a solid four. But albumin's an amazing negative phase reactant, right? If this patient has an active inflammatory condition, your albumin's going to drop. Where I'm looking for somewhere between three and a half to three to tell me there's an active inflammation. Granted, you got things like CRP and so forth, but albumin's even more it's even a better marker to let you know there's a systemic inflammation happening because what your body's trying to do at that moment is compensate, right? Having massive inflammatory markers, but a solid albumin means there potentially could be a little bit of a inability of the immune system to have an appropriate compensation because it should react and underreact at the same time. Albumin is one of those negative phase reactants that I look for that tells me that your immune system's in nice harmony. So um, just an FYI for future, no worries, Laura. I, I love albumin, but I, maybe it's just, I'm very biased and, but it's a, we gotta appreciate what it can do and what it doesn't do. I'm gonna try to find it, but I'm not sure if I will, because I think if I had seen it, I would have put it here, but I'm gonna try to find it. <laughs> but I think you can go on and test it if you, if you feel like it. No, I, I mean, I don't, I mean, his CRP is high, ESR is low. I mean, the challenges that I, I'm going to take with a lot of grain of salt is, you know, he got a lot of the, he got all of this done while on steroids. And do you know the course of the steroids where he was in the beginning or somewhere smack in the middle? Uncertain. Uncertain. I'm sorry. So it's do okay. you want me to, to jump into the imaging? Because I, I have... I have images. Oh, of course I do. I'm a lung doctor. What do you? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen with you. Just a moment. Can you see it? Oh wait, I'm telling you the answer. Wait a minute. Wait, pretend you didn't see that. No worries, Laura. <laughs> I know I didn't. Yeah, we didn't we didn't see any. Okay. It was still okay. loading for me, so we're good. Oh, amazing. Okay. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so I have um, a chest x-ray. 
and then can you do you want to say anything about it or should i just yeah i mean so what comes to mind you know the spinal processes are right staring at us so there's no potential confounding that this patient could be rotated his carina is right exactly where it, uh, i would looked for it in order to kind of have a nice little landmark costophrenic angles are apparent uh they're not blunted no effusion well i'm gonna stand by that i'm gonna say no effusion um you know maybe the left side you can yeah they're there uh apices are good no air that i could make a sense of um from this imaging and from the heart standpoint i mean you see a space in between the apex and the costophrenic angles and you have the kind of two slope uh two angles to kind of give you an impression that the left atrium is also not overloaded. Um, so from that standpoint, it looks fine. There are some interstitial markings that are fascinating. Presumably this was taken before a chest CT because it's not kind of a typical penetration. So I can't tell if I'm overreading it. So I think I'll wait for the chest CT to pop up next. Or PFTs, look at you, Lara. <laughs> Man, you really want this lung doctor to be happy. Um, but did you want to continue finishing the imaging before we go? Or was that the only imaging? Presumably yeah, yeah. No, no, I have the CT. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to. Ah, all right. So yeah, so what we're seeing, Laura, is probably what helps reaffirm that physical exam finding of bibasal or rails. Um, but you're definitely seeing um, infiltrates to uh, essentially ground glass opacifications um, in this cut that you're presenting to us below the carina, um, already branching out. So we're probably somewhere in the middle lobe on the right side, in addition to the lower lobe, with the upper apice still apparent in the anterior part of the CT scan. But at the bases, you're definitely seeing a lot more ground glass opacifications um, throughout. It's hard to make any notion of what the airways look like because there's a few sections that were cut. But kind of the distribution at the bases, at the dorsal, as opposed to more of the anterior, is fascinating. Um, it seems like the central process, the central part of the lungs seems to be spirit, but it's one slice, so hard for me to say that's a true pattern or it just happens to be for this one slice. Okay, so it seems, it, and this is near the basis as well, so um, maybe a little bit of a sliver of a pleural fusion um, by Beisler as well, but uh, again, Increased interstitial markings. This is a CT scan done without contrast, or at least there isn't contrast present on this imaging. So a lot of plump blood vessels and a lot of ground glass opacifications throughout. What I don't appreciate is any honeycombing. What I don't appreciate is any massive consolidations. Yeah, the, this continues to kind of reaffirm. So presumably you're showing us the basis because the apices are fine, right? Apices are skyrocket. So whatever's happening is happening at the bases bilaterally, right? Where there's a ton more blood flow going to it. Um, and, you know, things like lymphomas can spread much easier at the bases, other cancers, but there isn't a, you know, nice nodule or anything. This seems to be rather scattered. Okay, so do you want to see the, the spirometry now? Sure. I also have a bronchoscopy. <laughs> so the flow volume loops that Laura is showing us, remember uh, above is expiratory and below is inspiratory. And then you, right next to it is the volume um, y-axis, time on the x-axis, which seems to be kind of a flattening, but look at that flow volume curve. So what I want you guys to take away when you look at flow volume curves, it should look like a triangle, right? Kind of a right angle to some extent, goes up smoothly and then falls down with one linear motion. What you can make of the argument here is that there's two slopes, right? Oh, can I draw on this or can I not? I don't think I can. 
All right. So Laura, take your mouse and trace over the flow volume loop, starting at the top, at the top, keep going up, keep it right there. Now trace it down, 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 and stop, right? Now you're kind of going into a different slope. Do you guys recognize that? Do you guys see? So whenever we talk about obstructive diseases, the reason why it has a scooped out approach is because there's parts of the lungs that are emptying quickly, normally, and there's other parts of the lungs that are emptying slowly. So you get two superimposed flow volume loops all at once that creates that, that um, scooped out look. The challenge is sometimes what you see in a flow volume loops doesn't get captured with regards to any remnants of obstructive disease when the PFTs that you had a little bit up. So sometimes I see this because people look at the PFT numbers and they're like, oh, it's not obstructive. I'm like, oh, look at the flow volume loop. Because you can catch early parts of obstruction that may not cross and be arbitrary cutoffs that we put, but it may be enough to be a symptomatic pathology for a patient. So always look at the curves. It's the first thing I look at before I even go to the numbers. Their obstruction is just not significant enough because the volume time curve is almost flattening. So if you want to go up to the numbers, Laura. Perfect. So FEV1, 89%, FEC, 80%, presumably the ratio. Yeah, not in the obstructive range, wouldn't expect to it. I usually expect obstructive if the vo volume time curve shows an inability to plateau. But there is some characteristic, small, a, a touch of airway disease that I would say potentially is there. Um, do we have anything else like a TLC or a DLCO? I have the, wait a minute, um, I'll have to stop sharing because I have to be in the other part, which has me as in just a minute. Um, no worries. If not, we can use the a surrogate of the FVC, which seems to be uh, reduced, which speaks more to potentially some level of a restrictive pathology. I mean, you could try to make the argument reasonably that the pattern we were seeing, it's definitely not a UIP pattern if we wanted to pursue down the ILD approach, maybe a little bit of an NS, NSIP just because of so much ground glass opacifications bilaterally. But from my standpoint, I still wanna make sure we're not missing anything else. And, you know, again, keep in mind, I mean, what scares me to some extent is seeing that and, and knowing that steroids were on him so, you know, opportunistic infection if he wasn't on PJP prophylaxis versus anything else. And I guess one other point, Laura, to make timeline, did his cough get worse with the steroids? No, I don't think it got worse, but it didn't get better. I, I think it didn't, it didn't change. Okay. So what I have here is um, it says that the spirometry was um, within normal limits. There was no significant response after bron bronchodilator use and also su supernormal expiratory flows. Um, diffusion of carbon monoxide with moderate reduction. Um, so total lung was reduced? Yeah. And okay. total lung capacity is slightly reduced. Uh, residual volume is slightly reduced and RV um, over TLC ratio within normal limits. So um, it was a mild restrictive disorder associated with moderately reduced carbon monoxide diffusion. Okay. I mean, yeah, we saw all those infiltrates at the basis of the lungs, which is predominant vasculature. So you would expect a DLCO to be reduced in that fashion. And I also have um, the bronchoscopy results. Yeah, show us. And Rafa, you asked about bronchiectasis. I didn't see any in the slices. It doesn't necessarily mean there wasn't any there, but I just didn't appreciate any. But yeah, if you uh, want to, it was, it was hard to choose the slices. Um. <laughs> no worries, Laura. We understand. No okay. worries. Um, so uh, lung se lung sections showing stromal fibrosis with few air spaces lined with prominent pneumocytes with intraluminal histiocytes. There are few nodules of fib fibromyxoid proliferation presence of discrete inflammatory infiltrate of mononuclear cells and enterocosis foci. 
uh, pulmonary fibrosis findings without specific morphological pattern. So what kind of biopsy was this? Was this a bronchoscopy biopsy, transbronchial? Okay. So that's that. The, um, the last exam that I have is a surgical lung biopsy, which was taken um, in October, and then the final diagnosis. Okay, so he's having pulmonary fibrosis on the image when the biopsy, which I agree in of itself is not going to be responsive to steroids. So it's not surprising it's not responsive to steroids. Um, did I miss anything else other than the fibrosis that you're putting up? I mean, again, like keep in mind, like the that pattern in of itself, I would not call it a usual interstitial pattern, a UIP, for me to say, oh, that's IPF. So he, you can have fibrosis for many diseases, right? It's not the only one that gives you it. But the fact that he's having a fibrotic response and it's pretty diffuse throughout, you know, that uh, CT scan, it's concerning. So without a specific pattern on the imaging. So, cause you know, your ILD people will make it clear. Like you, you rarely, like the fact that you guys are biopsying him to me rules would rule out IPF cause it almost doesn't get you a biopsy of the lung. Oh, actually, Laura, next question. Do you know if the yeah. patient developed a pneumothorax after uh, the biopsy? No, I don't think he did. Which is another- I don't remember anymore, but I don't think he did. Yeah, it's a it's pretty a sensitive marker to say this could be IPF. That's why we don't biopsy these patients. They usually develop a pneumothorax. It's very hard to treat. Okay, so sorry, colon biopsy or um, Anne-Marie, do you wanna say something? No, I guess um, just before the surgical lung biopsy, any kind of other other thoughts, um, you know, about what could be going on or um, anything else? Yeah, the only other thing that I could make a case for, and it's challenging is like, could this be also a hypersensitivity pneumonitis picture? Um, more of an HP because of the subtleness of the fibrosis, meaning like, did he have enough exposure to something that has transitioned to that? Because HP usually has more of an NSIP picture to it, um, but it would just necessitate a lot of exposure over and over again. And to get HP to be refractory to steroids, you can see that it just depends where you catch it. Um, so that's the only thing that comes to mind from my standpoint, potentially to be something along those lines. Great, amazing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read read it to you. So um, interstitial fibrosis with frequent acinolobular architectural distortion with axial predominance, moderate nonspecific chronic inflammation with bronchiocentric accentuation, bronchiocentric fibrosis with foci of central lobular connective blockage. Frequent uh, peribronchular alveolar metaplasia, uh, pneumonia in focal organization, occasional honeycombing, and occasional intralobular fib fibrous bridges, moderate vascular sclerosis, moderate and heter heterogeneous pleural fibrosis. The most suitable diagnostic um, hypothesis is hypersensitivity in the mood. Um, you just said it. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yes. That was not the intention. Um, sounds good. And there was no granulomas? Um, I, I don't think so. No, no, I see this because it's, so HP is one of the differentials for non caseating granulomas. But this actually is an interesting part to make a case if, Granulomas in HP are very, they're there, but they're so rare versus sarcoid, they're much more abundant and so forth. So, I mean, well, the only reason I'm bringing up HP, look, when you showed me the CT scan slices, remember I was saying like, it's predominantly the bases where a ton of blood flow would be. So clearly, and not at the apices where you said is spared. And right, that's typical for HP because you need something to either be inhaled aggressively 
or to, but it, so hypersensitivity neuritis. Sorry, let me backtrack real quick. It's a, remember, in your hypersensitivities one, two, three, and four, it's more of a type three. So it's going to usually impact the bases more than the apices because you need blood flow to bring some unique antibodies plus the inhaled product to kind of in combination work together. So you'll see it predominantly there. You know, looking at that now with this, you know, those eyes, that fits more of an NI, a non-specific interstitial pneumonia pattern because there's no, there's no honeycombing, guys, right? No honeycombing was seen there. All you saw was fibrosis on the pathology biopsy. So that should mean like, all right, you got subclinical or you got only histological fibrosis, but it hasn't manifested to radiological findings. The fact that this man did not get better on steroids means one of two things. The fibrosis is clearly happening a lot um, or that he just continues to be around whatever is triggering his HP. Like I have tons of pigeon farmers who refuse to give up their pigeons. And I'm like, oh, there's not, not amount of steroids I can give you that's going to fix this. Um, and yeah, so let me stop there, Laura. Did you guys uh, end up sending an HP panel? Um, the trigger was not identified, but assumed yeah. to be the mode because of like the, his mother-in-law's um, house and he, he would visit um, her like every weekend. And um, we started with um, nintedanib. I'm not, I'm not sure if this is how you say it, but anti-fibrotic. Um, we kept a prednisone and he started with myco mycophilinate mofetil. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. And, and now he's, um, he's doing pulmonary rehabilitation and still taking the nintedanib. So I, I so my my biggest fear sometimes with patients who don't have an identified HP source because usually like the the way you help hypersensitive hypersensitivity pneumonitis is you try to get them away from the trigger um, if you can't identify granted there's like an HP panel a piece of blood work the challenge is like it's just going to send out for things that we know can cause it doesn't necessarily mean it is what causes it um, and so. From that standpoint, it's just, if this disease is progressing, like, you know, he should also be evaluated for a lung transplant at some point as well. I mean, he still has reserve, you know, his DLC is still fine. But if you can't, like, you, you know what I mean? Like, all your guys are providing him is to mitigate the immune response. Challenge is, you know, we're at the fibrosis level subclinically where I, I can't tell you in confidence is it's going to stop the progression. Um, this is a really good case. I'm hoping we figure out what's going on. Uh, not going to, we know what's going on, but hopefully we can figure out how to mitigate its progression. But it, it is really removing the, the etiology because right? it's an allergic reaction, right? If you eat peanuts and got anaphylactic and you ate them every day, someone will tell you, regardless of all the epi shots I can give you, just stop eating the peanuts. Same thing with a type three hypersensitivity, which is this. You really have to remove the source. These immunomodulators, they're not, you know, they slow the progression, but they don't stop the progression. Does that make sense, Laura? So yes. um, what are some of the most common triggers um, that you've seen of hypersensitive pneumonitis? You mentioned uh, birds, but any other ones that you commonly see? So really almost anything can cause it, like anything that you inhale. Commonly birds are like some of our big key topics that we think of um, that could potentially be causing this. Um, but other things like roaches can cause it, like, you know, just, you know, certain dust, certain um, uh, insect particulates can cause it. Um, certain toxins can cause it. I have a, you know, in our clinic, we diagnosed the first case of vaping induced HP but secondhand vaping induced, right? So any, any inhalant can technically cause it from a common standpoint. I would say this, it's more common to not identify it. It's more common to not being able to say, aha, that's what caused it. That's a challenge. If you give steroids and it's gone away, I will be honest, it's not usually the steroids. It's usually this person's removed themselves from the situation and it's gone away. So some, when we can't figure out what's going on with the patient, you do try to make, see if they can do some lifestyle changes to treat it and, and 
to okay. Like one of our most famous cases here in Maryland is the Eastern Shore where they used for a decade bird fertilizer to, um, you know, use for the farms. And the winds would carry those particles miles away. There's a lot of various HP cases that developed that we couldn't really nail down. Blood work wouldn't come up with the ideology, but that was the best that we could slew through with some environmentalists to figure out like maybe that's the, the cause of it because it all happened downstream in a clustering effect from where the winds would carry and so forth. So it's much more common to not find an etiology, but you do ask them to try to do some lifestyle changes to see if it has any impact on that. And I say this large because like mold is like, it's hard for me to say mold because you don't need a lot to get HP. You just need the right thing. Any yeah. final, um Sorry, Lori, go ahead. I just want to say it is really hard because it is really hard to find the cause. So it's, I feel like almost there's nothing you can do besides transplant. Like if the person never, never finds uh, what was causing. So I don't know. I, I think it's uh, a really sad disease. Yeah, no, I mean, again, you try to see if they can do any, I mean, this is like the ultimate lifestyle change. Like, you know, do you change homes? You know, do you do A, B, and C? Because HP is not something that you've been exposed to all the time and suddenly you develop as an adult. It's something that you must have just met recently and your body reacted to it like that. So if he's always gone to his mother's house every weekend for the last decades, like that, that's why I'm struggling to say like, that's the culprit. And again, this is not like, look, everyone's having these thoughts. It's, it, it is like the ultimate, you know, like house. And if you guys have ever watched that TV series where they go and like sleep through, that's what you're looking for. You're looking to see what new exposures he may have had over the last year and a half to two years that could potentially still be present for him that's resulted in this. It's, it's tough. I mean, you guys are doing all the right things. The work of, by the way, Laura is spot on. Like it's very good. Um, so I applaud you with that and keep like a big life lesson for you guys in the lung world. If you throw steroids and it doesn't change shortness of breath or the cough, then you're looking for a, a steroid non-responsive disease. That's a bit like, that's, you got my attention on that. Like, you gave that much prednisone and nothing happened to the cough. This isn't asthma, right? This isn't any eosinophilic process. Something's going on. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for presenting just a wonderfully put together um, case that um, just with all the information, it was such a great learning case. I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks so much for Pan East for the awesome uh, discussion and all the learning points. Um, Kiara, um, do you want to uh, take us away with um, teaching points? Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for this amazing case. Very educational. And I learned a lot. So we start with uh, Dr. Panagi's favorite word, which is cough. And he, fir he first uh, told us that we have to think about what is the lung trying to clear when we have a cough, because this is like a mechanism, a, a mechanism from our body. Um, then we, we, found, we found out that this patient was, um, was under a, a, a scenario of moles, but Dr. Panagis clarified us that we are always breathing in and breathing out mold. And the difference is that we, we are uh, like immunocompetent people and we, we are able to breathe out mold, uh, but in, immunosuppress in immunos immunocompromised patient or when there, there is an underlying condition, for example, um, a cavern or something there, uh, probably we are not able to breathe out that mold. Also, uh, we found that this patient didn't have fever and we were told today that uh, we need a correct immune system to, to develop fever. Then we had uh, albumin as a marker. So Dr. Panagis li likes albumin because this is a very great marker for systemic inflammation. And when we have other marker, other markers high, for example, C-reactive protein, but when we have like albumin, 
not high, probably our immune system is not working well. And then we have uh, uh, many images and we found that, that there was a likely pattern of pulmonary fibrosis, but there was not like a honeycomb pattern. So probably this was not exactly the, the cause of the disease. And also uh, the patient wasn't responding to asteroids. And Dr. Panagis told us that when we have a pulmonary fibrosis, most of the times they don't respond to asteroids. Some other diseases that don't respond well to asteroids, maybe asthma or many other uh, hyperosinophilic, hyperosinophilic syndromes. So finally, we found that this patient had like bilateral basal um, fibrotic patterns, uh, likely consistent with hypersensitivity, hi hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And this is like, this is very strange and difficult to diagnose uh, disease because there is a persistent exposure, but most of the times we don't find which is this exposure. And this is most common to find in the bases more than the apex. And this is something interesting because when we give asteroids to those patients and they don't respond, probably is because the exposure have per persist. And some common triggers are birds, dust, toxins. Um, but as I said before, most of the time we cannot identify those toxins, those antigens. So thank you so much, Dr. Panagis, Laura, and all the team for this amazing discussion. Yeah, strong work. This was a great case. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, thank guys. You thank you so, so much. much. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Bye.